John Lee tells the story in his autobiography of how when he was a young monk and first heard the idea of going out into the forest, into the wilderness actually, to practice, it didn't make any sense to him. Why put yourself through all that hardship, he said. And if you have to realize that the wilderness in Thailand back in those days is very different from what it is now. And people's attitudes towards wilderness were different as well. Nowadays, wilderness is just little bits and pieces, little islands surrounded by civilization. And it seems very tame. We have all those wonderful pictures from the Sierra Club of how beautiful wilderness can be. We value it. We cherish it. But in John Lee's time, the situation was just the other way around. Civilization was little islands of settlement and the sea of wilderness. And the wilderness was scary. Wild animals, dreaded diseases, all sorts of discomforts. Human society was all about taming wilderness, with the feeling that wilderness could take over at any time. So the general value was very much against wilderness. And this extended from the cities out into the villages. But John Lee said, well, the Buddha said, it's good for the practice. So he's willing to put his preconceived notions aside and give it a try. And he discovered many important lessons that come from being in the wilderness. One was that you learn how to be very careful, very heedful. He said you learn from animals. He talked about the time when he and some monks and novices were going for alms, and they saw a mother bird, kind of like a wild chicken, calling out to her chicks when she saw the monks come. The chicks went running into a pile of leaves. And John Lee knew that the pile of leaves was full of little baby chicks, so I had one of the novices take a stick and kind of stir around in the pile, see if he get the chicks to come out, and they wouldn't. The chicks lay very still, very still, very still. And that was their protection. So the lesson here was when storms go blowing through the mind, or around you in society outside, sometimes the wisest policy is just to stay very still. You can watch, and you're least likely to get blown around by the storm. This is just one of many lessons he said that he could learn from living in the wilderness. The important thing here, though, of course, is that he was willing to put aside his preconceived notions and the values of his society at his time and give the Buddhist teachings a try. This has been a defining characteristic of the wilderness tradition, the forest tradition, all along. Think about the time of Ajahn Mun. There had been reforms in Bangkok trying to bring in more texts, better versions of the canon, the commentaries, in the generation before his. And it was just in his generation, or just before it, that a lot of these reforms were spreading out into the, into the villages, into the provinces. By the time they had spread there, new values had come up in Bangkok, a strong sense that Thailand was being threatened from outside. And England was eating away at Thailand from the west and the south. France was eating in from the east and the north. And Thailand was going to have to reform. They needed an education, educational system. So the government came up with the idea of having the monks become teachers. They had no teacher training colleges at that point. Monasteries were encouraged to give land to build schools. And to this day, most of the schools you see in Thailand are built on monastery land. 
and monks were encouraged and ultimately told they had to become teachers in the school. So there was actually a law passed requiring monks to settle down and to get to work teaching the kids. What the forest tradition did was go further into the forest, further into the wilderness. So John Mun went way up into Chiang Mai, and he was accused of being cowardly and being unhelpful, being lazy. because he wasn't falling in line with modern ideals. But we look back now, okay? who was actually preserving Buddhism at that time? And John Munn in his little grass hut up in the hills. He was the person keeping Buddhism alive, because he, kept, because he kept the practice alive and he was willing to say, well, whatever the Buddha says, let's give it a try. regardless of what our own preconceived notions are. Maybe the Buddha knows something that we don't. And this is the attitude that keeps the practice alive, this attitude of call it humility, respect. And John Munn called it following the traditions of the Noble Ones. There's a sutta, the Arya Wangsa, that can be called the customs of the Noble Ones and the traditions or the lineage of the Noble Ones, and its four qualities. That the Buddha says are true from time immemorial, and that formed the customs of the Noble Ones. And John Munn's comment when people accused him of not participating in modern ideals was that well, modern ideals have been worked up by people with defilements. But here are some customs that were left behind by people with no defilement. I was talking last night to someone who was saying that he trusts in modernization because he trusts in human nature. And I was a little slow on the uptake, but I should have asked him, which part of human nature do you trust? Do you trust the greed or the aversion or the delusion? But the Christians and the noble ones are things that we should give a try. They start out with three principles in being content. Being content with whatever food you get, whatever clothing you get, whatever shelter you get. And this is important. I was reading recently about a archaeological dig they've done in Syria, where they found what was probably one of the very earliest cities, and even before Mesopotamia. And the message of the dig was that with the rise of cities and the rise of civilization was also the rise of warfare. In order to get nice things to consume, people have to go out and fight or else protect what they've got. This is why we have armies. This is why we have huge defense expenditures, because we want nice things to eat, nice things to wear, nice places to live. So the principles of the noble ones go in the opposite direction. Try to be as content with, as you can with whatever you get. Monks are told when they're first ordained, be content with alms food, be content with whatever rags you can find, be content with living under the shade of a tree. The principle being that the simpler your use of the requisites, the less of a burden you're placing on other people. But an important part of this principle is that you not pride yourself on how frugal you are compared to other people. So you don't exalt yourself, you don't disparage others because you are content in these ways. That's a tall order. But it's this that makes our con consumption of the requisites something without danger. Because on the one hand, we use as little as possible, so we're pressing others as little as possible in that way. And at the same time, we're not letting our minds get puffed up, which is the other danger that can come from 
this sort of practice. And human beings are amazing. They can get puffed up about their possessions, or they can get puffed up about how their possessions are very few. That's something that's worth contemplating right there, our ability to get proud about whatever. Some people are proud that they eat an awful lot. Other people are proud that they can get by with very little food. John Lee talks about how when he was a young monk, he and the other monks would have a contest to see who could get by on the least food. Which goes to show that the real danger lies in the mind. You've got to realize you're practicing frugality, you're practicing contentment, not to make yourself better than other people or to show off that you're better than other people, but because the mind has this disease of greed, this disease of pride. And we've got to work on that disease. because it disturbs the mind and it creates disturbances around us, if we're not careful. And I found for myself when I was living in Thailand, things were very, very meager at what Damasa did those first couple of years I was there. And it was good coming up against difficulties just in having water to use or just in having enough blankets at night. You wouldn't think about that being a problem in Thailand, but it would get relatively cold sometimes. And so it brings up things in the mind. Oh, I'm attached to this, I'm attached to that. And on the one hand, it teaches you ingenuity, how to make the most of what you've got. And it also makes you ask, okay, exactly to what extent is comfort that important in life? What are the prices of comfort? What are the prices of having the choices of many different things to wear? What's the price of having a really nice place to live? There's that great story of the, the former king who was now a monk. Padilla was sitting under a tree saying, What bliss, what bliss. The monks heard this, they were concerned, afraid that he was thinking about the time back when he was a king. So they informed the Buddha. The Buddha calls Padilla to see him and asks him, What are you thinking about when you say, What bliss, what bliss? And Padilla thinks about it. I think about the time when I was a king and couldn't sleep, even though I had. Guards posted inside the palace and outside the palace and inside the city and outside the city. I was always afraid someone was going to kind of try to come and take away what I had. But now I sit under the tree, don't see any danger from any direction, but my mind is free as a wild deer. That's what I think, what bliss, what bliss. So a lot of things you learn when you're willing to submit yourself the customs of the noble ones, the principles or the traditions of the noble ones. So that you can call your modern cultural values into question. The fourth tradition, you would think, would have to do with medicine. We'd have that chant about the different requisites as food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. But here it's something different. It's taking delight in abandoning and taking delight in developing. Of course, what this means is you take delight in abandoning unskillful mental qualities and delight in developing skillful ones. Again, that goes against the values of our culture. A lot of our culture is derived from greed. They like to aggravate our greed. They like to aggravate our aversion. They like to aggravate our delusion so that we enjoy being greedy. Greed is good. Remember that? Look where it's taken us. And people find it in their interest to get everybody really angry. 
to the point where he can't talk to one another in a reasonable and civil way. And there are people who be willing to go along with that. And delusion is rampant. And so it takes a lot of strength to pull out of those values and say, wait a minute, maybe somebody else's interest to have me greedy and averse and deluded, but it's not in my interest. And it's not really in our common interest to develop those things. So as you're practicing, you're really pulling out of the values of society at large. And this applies whether you're in India 2,500 years ago, or here in America, or in Thailand, or Japan, Korea, wherever. The simple fact of trying to develop skillful qualities in your mind and delight, to delight in developing skillful qualities and delight in abandoning unskillful ones, that really places you outside of the social, the social norm. After all, we're told that people who don't give full expression, say, to their sexuality are warped and all cramped up and unhappy people. But the Buddha said, no, restraint leads to happiness. Restraint is good. Not just because it makes you a good little boy or a good little girl, but it's really good for you and makes you happy deep down inside. There's a part of the mind that really thrives on restraint. You find that as you look for fewer and fewer comforts in terms of things to look at and things to listen to, you turn more and more to the mind. What qualities can you develop in the mind that give a sense of well-being when things outside are not quite so comfortable? And you find there's these huge dimensions in the mind that it would otherwise get more allowed to atrophy, shrivel up and dwindle away. So it's an important principle, taking the Buddha at his word. Maybe he knew something. Maybe his teachings are worth giving a try. Your normal Western attitude is that we come up across something and our immediate reaction is, well, let's reform it. Change it in lines with what we think should the way things should be. And the Buddha is basically saying, well, how about changing yourself? Everything he teaches points inside us, and the problems lie inside. So let's work on those first. And when you take him at his word, you find you learn an awful lot of things that you wouldn't have learned in any other way. So it's useful to keep that image of a John Mun up in the mountains of Chiang Mai, just sitting, walking. being very alert, heedful, ardent, and resolute, as they say in the text. That was what kept the Dharma alive for us. You have a sense of gratitude, a sense of appreciation for what he did. And that, of course, inspires you to think about, well, what can I do? What's right here? being heedful, ardent, and resolute. That's what keeps the Dharma alive. <laughs>